Have you told your friends that you see ghosts? Oh, absolutely not. Gina Rodriguez returns in Not Dead Yet. I'm back, baby. Who is that? Oh, she's the obituary writer. And Brad Garrett joins the brilliant ensemble cast. Titan, Maverick, Titan of all Mavericks. These are all words used to describe me. Baby, I got you shook. Got you shook. Not Dead Yet. Season premiere tonight, 8 30, 7 30 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Kylie, now and then on TikTok, amazing things pop up or things that, well, they grab my attention. I mean, it's the whole idea of TikTok, right? Attention grabbing. Something came up just the other day that I think is really important for every parent, and I'm going to play it for you now. It goes for just over two and a half minutes, but there is just some gold in here for every parent who has a child who is stressed out, anxious, worried, fearful, apprehensive, or feeling like life is too hard. This video is a response to the below comment. Today's youth poisoned by affluence and overprotective parents has crippled their durability and motivation. Very sad, but predictable. I want to share some information that gives a different perspective on what durability and resilience really mean. Roughly 20 years ago, an episode of Good Morning America featured a live experiment. A scientist named Rick Snyder appeared with a cold presser tank, which is a device that uses ice water to measure someone's pain tolerance. Snyder challenged three men to hold their hands underwater for as long as they could. Now, prior to the taping, he had given each of them a short questionnaire, and unbeknownst to the participants, he used their answers to predict which one of them would be first, second, and third to pull their hand out. At the end of the experiment, Snyder revealed that his predictions turned out to be correct. How did he know who would last the longest? Rick Snyder was the world's first researcher to begin studying hope. Now, before we get into what it actually means to be hopeful, here's some statistics that have been shown consistently across many hundreds of studies on the subject. Hopeful people outperform their peers in just about every metric. School performance, athletic performance, climbing up the career ladder, responding to cancer treatment, trauma recovery, meeting literally any challenge tested. As for the ice water experiment, hopeful people have a higher pain threshold, which is how Rick Snyder, using a questionnaire that measured each participant's level of hope, was able to predict who would last the longest. So what is hope? There are two requirements to meet the scientific definition. Number one, you have to be able to see a path to where you want to go. So for example, having a goal to make more money isn't useful unless you can actually see a way for you to start making more money. And number two, you have to believe that your personal effort plays an important role in bringing about the results. This only happens from lived experience. For example, if you set a goal to get an A on a test and you study really hard, your hope will increase if you get an A, but it will likely decrease if you don't get an A after putting in that work. So we need to experience success in order to believe in ourselves. This requires starting with small achievable things and working our way up to more difficult goals. So cultivating high hope is what creates people who are resilient and up for meeting a challenge. And this is done through repeated goal setting followed by achievement. Affluence and overparenting don't make people less tough. That's what hopelessness does. If we want to raise people who can persevere, the only thing we need to do is help them personally and consistently experience the power of hope for themselves. This means not overburdening them with challenges that are beyond their current abilities, and it means not throwing them into the deep end before they've learned how to swim. This results in lower levels of hope, not increased levels of resiliency. Hope is essential for overcoming obstacles, and humans need love, patience, and support while they learn to both see a goal and reach a goal. Okay, Kylie, there's a lot of information in there. I think we need to break it down because when kids are feeling hopeless, which I mean, the the research literature around what's happening to our youth right now is staggering and it shows that a lot of them are feeling hopeless. Our job is to be hope builders. That's what parents need to do. But it's really tricky to be a hope builder. What does the latest data tell us? So the National Study of Mental Health and Wellbeing has just come out in the last little while, and it's flagged that the rate of anxiety disorders in our 16 to 24-year-olds is around about 21% for boys and 41% for girls. Now, to compare that to the 2007 National Study, anxiety disorders in that same group, 15%. 
So as we look at what's happened over the last, uh, not even full decade yet, particularly with COVID in the middle of it, we've gone from 15% anxiety levels to 21% for boys, 41% for girls. And anxiety is fear or apprehension, worry about the future. It's that thing where you just think things are not going to be okay. You feel hopeless rather than hopeful. It's interesting. There seems to be two camps in society. We either want to blame the school system for where our kids are sitting, social media gets added in there, or we're looking at parents as being overbearing, overprotective and crippling our children. But I love what she said, this idea of being, like you say, a hope builder and what that actually does to build resilience in our kids. Okay, did you pick up, so she's talking about research from a guy called uh, C.R. Snyder, Rick Snyder, who passed away just a few years ago. His other main collaborator and one of the world's foremost hope researchers, a guy called Shane Lopez, has also done a lot of work in this area. Now, she said there are two things that help us to build hope in our kids. But then she talked about a number of extra things. What did you pick up on? It's really important that if we're going to build hope, we know what it is and how to build it. Well, she said that one of the most important things we needed to do to help our kids find hope was that they needed to be able to see a pathway to reach their goals. Okay, so I'm going to pause you right there. In in Snyder's framework, there are actually, that's two things, not one. So she's com- compiled that into one, but it's actually two things. Number one, to be hopeful, you need to have a goal. Do you think our kids are actually setting goals anymore? I don't know. I, I, mean, I, I don't feel like it plays a huge part in our children's lives like it did when we were growing up. I, I would I would generally agree with you. I certainly know across some families there's heavy emphasis on goals, but I'm not convinced that it's happening a- across the board. Not only do you have to have a goal, though, as you said, there's got to be a pathway to the goal. Now, there are two things that matter here. Number one, the kind of goal you're setting is important, but number two, pathways. It's one thing to say, oh, I want to be, I don't know, an astronaut. Or I want to have a whole lot of money, but if you don't have a way to get there, it doesn't make you feel hopeful. It makes you feel hopeless. Here's a simple case in point. When we were students, when I was going through school and we were struggling, I mean, we were living on nothing for eight and a half years while I was doing my undergrad and then my PhD. I used to every now and again complain to my parents that I had no money and we were really struggling. Now, I wasn't asking them for favors. I was just, they they would ask what we were up to and how things were going. And I'd be like, we don't have any money. My mum, who has been a serial entrepreneur, would say, well, just it sounds like you have a goal to have more money. And I would say, yeah. And she'd say, so just create it. Just create it. In other words, she's saying, find the pathway and walk along the pathway to where the pot of gold is at the end of the pathway. But how did you feel every time she said that? I felt hopeless because I couldn't see a pathway to that financial creation. I remember going to different uh, seminars that she would send us along to. Yes. And we would listen to these financial gurus talk about the pathways that they had taken to create financial freedom in their lives and looking at you going, how do we do that? It's completely unreasonable, completely out of reach. It's not possible to do what they're saying to do. We can't even pay our bills now and they're telling us to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, invest this much in the property market (laughs) or the shares or whatever. But the critical thing here is we had a goal. We, the goal was we needed to get our finances in order and we wanted to save for our retirement or whatever, uh, try to find some kind of financial freedom. But we did not have any pathways. I was a student and all I could see in front of me was completing my degree. So for our children to be hopeful, they definitely need to have something that they're working towards. It might be their school and academic grades and outcomes or doing well in the cross country or the athletics carnival, the swimming carnival that's coming up. But they've got to have a pathway. And every now and again, you might have a pathway and then something happens and the gate shuts on that pathway. So hopeful people don't just have one pathway. When a gate shuts on them, they find a way over the fence, under the fence, around the fence. They find another way to get onto another pathway that will take them towards the goal. Well, the second thing that she talked about was the fact that they had a belief that personal effort would bring about results. The fancy word for this is agency thinking. That is, if I make an effort, it will yield fruit. So I remember being in high school and doing exams and working really hard and studying hard and setting a goal that I wanted to get a certain grade and then coming out the other end and finding out that I didn't achieve what I'd hoped. And it just crushed me. 
because I'd put in all of that effort and I'd worked so hard and yet I didn't see the fruits of my efforts. It just made me feel like I wanted to give up. So how do we help our kids? Because we're going to set goals and sometimes we're not going to make them. Yeah. This we're is, not going to reach them. This is where I want to bring in my favorite metaphor when it comes to building hope and resilience in our kids. If anyone's ever seen me present on this topic in a conference, this is the one that I close with. I think it's the most important thing of all. Um, what this TikToker, whose name, by the way, I should give credit, In Search of Bobcat, what In Search of Bobcat has said towards the end of the video is really important. Our job is not to overburden kids. That does not build them hope and it does not strengthen their resilience. And our job is not to throw them in the deep end. So when there is a failure experience, of course, everybody feels bad when they fail. That's normal. That's typical. That's human to feel like that. Our job when this failure experience happens is to just imagine your child on a balance beam. If we've got that toughen up princess, you need to be resilient approach, essentially they're on the balance beam and they fall off. That's the failure experience. Unfortunately, a lot of parents will say, well, you just need to get back up and get back up and have another go. I stumbled all of my words, but you know what I mean? They've just got to get up and do it again. But sometimes the fall can be far and it can be hard and it can lead to some real damage being done. Now, there are some parents nowadays, especially with so many kids who are suffering from anxiety, who go the opposite direction. They're so worried about their child and they're so anxious about their child that they jump up onto the balance beam and, and carry them across so that they won't fall off. But that doesn't build their resilience or their hope either. We can't carry our kids through life. When I went through high school, we did this balance beam task in PE class where while we were on the balance beam, we had one person on either side of us with a hand up ready to support us in case we tipped. And I think this is a beautiful metaphor for what we do as parents when our children have these challenges. Fail the test. Instead of falling off the balance beam, what the parents basically do is they put their hand up on your on your thigh and they say, okay, just lean against me. This is really hard. This hurts a lot. But guess what? You're still on the beam. You're still going to school. You're still in class. Everything can work out here. Just lean on my arm and take a breather. Have a think about it. And let's see if we can make a plan so that you can start stepping forward from here. Let's work out what help you need. Let's work out what support you need so that you can take these steps on your own. And when we do that, what we're essentially doing is we're saying failure is not an option. Let's help you to get to this goal. The goal is that you're going to pass the class and you're going to do well. You have run out of pathways because your own study methods haven't worked. But I think together we can come up with a plan. Maybe we're going to get a tutor. Maybe we're going to get a big brother or sister to work with you an hour or two every week. Maybe there's another way forward that we can divide together. And then third, I'm going to take my hand away now because I think that with the personal effort that you're going to put in, you can do this. Hope builder. Hope builder right there. The main thing that we want to do is see progress. Tiny wins, progress. These are the things that help build hope. We really hope that you can be a hope builder in your home. See what I did there? We hope that you can be a hope builder. <laughs> and we think that we've given you a goal, the pathways, and the belief that you can do it. Those three things that are necessary to build hope. Gee, we hope that it's helpful. Stop. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, really appreciate the work of Justin Rowan from Bridge Media, who produces the podcast and makes it sound great. Thank you also to Craig Bruce for the never-ending stream of ideas and ways to help us to reach people in more helpful ways. If you would like more information about how to make your family happier, we'd love to help. Visit us at happyfamilies.com.au. 